Poetry is my way of moving through the world. When I'm active in my poetry, I'm engaged in my life. That is a quote from our guest feature, Afa Michael Weaver, who comes from Boston and is an award-winning poet and playwright, a Fulbright scholar, professor of English literature, and an avid practitioner of Tai Chi, which has been suggested to be representative of his life and work in bringing together the different worlds of Chinese culture, African-American experience, and poetry. Afa grew up in Baltimore. His young parents did not finish high school. After Afa began to read, he said that his library card was his most prized possession, and words became his constant friend. He started to go to college for engineering, uh, but felt a stronger connection to writing poetry and eventually dropped out and noted I had always loved writing, but at the university, I began to sense it. It was what I did best, or what I was meant to do my purpose. He kept writing in his work, while going to work in factories for 15 years. And when he was working in the factories, he became famous for writing poems while working on the tally sheets that were smudged with grease. And when he was in the Army Reserves, he wrote romantic poems that he sold to his service buddies. <laughs> so if you have any poems from that period of time, from someone in the service. <laughs> in 1985, he was part-time writing uh, while working in the factories, and this writing led to publication of his first collection of poetry, Water Song, and his factory days came to an end, and he was awarded the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship to study creative writing at Brown University. Since then, he has been writing for his career, and he's just finished, I believe, his 10th book of poetry, published The Government of Nature. In addition to being very far-reaching and prolific with his writing of poetry, he has been working for many years in helping to bring the arts to community. He has done work in community programs in the black communities in the Boston area, including speaking to children from challenge backgrounds. Ava said, I bring the poetry in the person of myself to show young people what can be done in life. He also has worked in connecting with others, traveling beyond the borders of Boston to the other side of the world with poetry in China, where he's worked in translation projects and tried to build bridges of communication between Chinese and American poets and he convened a first conference in Chinese poetry at Simmons in 2004 and a second in 2008, which consisted of a gathering of distinguished poets from Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong. And currently, he teaches at Simmons College, where he holds the Alumni Endowed Chair. And if that were not enough, he has received the Pushcart Prize, fellowships from the NEI, NEA and the Pew Foundation and an appointment as Fulbright Scholar in Taiwan and the May Sarton Award, among others. And in fact, just yesterday in Baltimore, it was Afa Michael Weaver Day, declared in 2008 by the organizers of the City Lit Festival. Perhaps they were inspired by the opportunity to feel a bit of transcendence from his writing. As Afa acknowledged once in thinking about writing and his work and his philosophy, the things that we usually cling to for identity, such as race, culture, and personality, are all false. The true self is spiritual. When you act from the base of your true self, you embark on the path to transcendence. And so uh, Afa, in, in that quote, acknowledged it's a path that he uh, is happy to be on and feels that writing poetry helps him to move along the path, and may, we all move along with him today as he shares some of his poetry with us. So please help me give a round of applause to Afa Michael Weaver. I'm going to read from the uh, Government of Nature, and I'd like to um, give acknowledgement, uh, express gratitude to uh, two people in particular who helped make this book possible. 
One is my uh, teacher, Huang Qinliang, who teaches me Taoist sitting meditation, which I've been doing for 11 years now, and one of his disciples. And in Taiwan, my uh, godfather, uh, Ching Si Peng, who's emeritus professor at National Taiwan University, gave me my Chinese name. It also gave me a generous blurb for the back of the book. But um, he gave me the name Hui Ya Feng, which is taken from the first anthology of Chinese poetry, the uh, Shi Jing. And there's a section there called the Ya Fue poems. And so my name Ya Feng comes from um, the Ya Fue. So I wanted to put that thank you out there. Without the, um, the guidance from my teacher, I probably would not have been able to sort through my abusive childhood, which is a subject of this book. Um, the man who taught me everything I know about horses, or most of what I know, is also the man who brought great challenges into my life. Uh, one of my maternal uncles, my mother's youngest brother. And I'd like to begin with a poem entitled, The Ancestors Speak to the Cowboy, where they reprimand him for what he has done. The epigraph, rejoice if not in iniquity, 1 Corinthians 13th chapter 6 verse. In truth, you knew he was yours to teach, to guide, to know as spirit over the child flesh, to accept the way we knew each other in worlds before this, before the shadow made you an apostate, a rogue disciple, and pine rushes taught you lies or truth, and truth are lies, the killing space of saints. You sang back to it in baby boy voices, gave yourself over to the promise that life is a making, that absolutes are the way to define the touch. Your hand over his eyes when the spirit moved you as you told him it was a dream, that it was special, a map to outside worlds, countries on the other side of the door, sleeping into the metamorphosis, a rude betrayal, he full of your rawness of transmissions, long lines of generations recorded on dried bark, somewhere in the beginning of time where you fell head first into some lust, a sadness, misguided fingers turning pages in prophecies. If you tell, if you tell, the stars will turn against you. You will have not night, but emptiness. If you tell, you will live in an old house in the desert, all alone with cacti for friends. If you tell, people will hide their children from the monster others say your kind are. If you tell, the police will add you to the list of people who might have killed the albatross. If you tell, you will walk in a hollow room full of the sound of liar, liar, pants on fire. If you tell, poets will call it marketing, a ploy to get ahead in the game. If you tell, women will think you are trying to steal a place that is not yours. If you tell, you will become a stinky thing no aromatherapy will ever make sweet. If you tell, all the therapists you ever saw will claim you in reports to some conference. If you tell, you will see the wounded everywhere, shuffling legions, the murdered souls of children under angels' wings, beating a prayer in a place with no night, no day, no palladium of lies. So this book began in Taiwan and 2004, 2005 was my first sabbatical from Simmons and I moved to uh, Taipei to study Chinese for eight months. I lived there and I had started when I was 50 years old. It was my anti-senility project. <laughs> and while I was there, I had started, I had taken two years as a, a faculty audit at Simmons, just enough to get confused and I went to Taiwan and my teacher said, we're going to straighten you out over here. <laughs> and in the spring of 2005, uh, a friend who runs a monastery on the eastern coast of Taiwan in Hualien invited me to come over and teach Tai Chi to the nuns. So 
I am a black man in Taiwan teaching Tai Chi to nuns in a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> And so, and in Taiwan is a small place, it's an island, and everyone knows everyone's business, especially mine. So I come back to Taipei, and I'm going back to my language school, and after class one day, I'm walking up the street, and two little ladies are in front of me, and they think I don't understand what they're saying. They're speaking in Chinese. And they say, he was in, in Hualien teaching uh, Tai Chi Tuan. They say, Ta Hin Li Hai, Ta Zai Hualien Jiao Le Tai Chi. So they didn't know that I was listening to everything they were saying. My business was all over Taiwan. But um, the book began there, and I like to read a poem about the monastery. It's a beautiful place. It's called Hernan, and it sits about 150 yards from the Pacific Ocean, and it's built onto the side of a hill, and it's so lush and so green. Bamboo is, you know, bamboo is actually like a weed, but it's all everywhere. and. Uh, the garden is beautiful. This poem is entitled, Leaves. The lines that make you are infinite, but I count them every day to hear the stories you carry. These are not secrets but records, things we should know but ignore. If I commit the sin of tearing you from the tree, I find another world inside the torn vein, another lifetime of counting the records of who walked here before, of what lovers lay here, holding each other through wars and starvation. Some days I stand here until I lose focus and travel, drifting off out of the moment too full of it, and my legs are now like trees, mindless but vigilant, held into the earth by the rules of debt, what we owe to nature for trying to tear ourselves away. I drift and the pleasure of touch comes again, layers of green in the mountainside, a tickling in my palms. The pleasure is that of being lost here in the crowd of trunks and pulp, the ground thick with the death of you, sinking under my feet as I go, touching one and another, linking myself through until the place where I entered is gone. When I am afraid, my breath is caught in my throat. When I am not afraid, I lift both hands up under a bunch of you to find the way the world felt on the first day. The difficulty um, of, um, of the difficulties of growing out of an abused childhood are many, not the least of which are the challenges to having a healthy relationship. Emotional intimacy, physical intimacy are difficult things. Evening Lounge, After the Painting by Brent Lynch. The humid nights are best and worst, best because the birds sing at two in the morning when you cannot get back into the other world, worst because it is the moist heat that makes the skin supple, makes you want to rub against someone else a woman, and there is nothing but the long list of lost chances, things you could have said, perhaps the simple question of, will you sleep with me? So that it is not just you and this shell of a home, this place where it feels the walls are another layer of my skin, and that is neither best or worst. It is the holding of the dead stink, the memories that wash over me, holding them back. It is the utter singleness of being the only person here, the way the thoughts think themselves down to accepting that this is really just me here wondering who I am. Just me here wondering why I am awake at two, which trigger it was, knowing all the time all too well the way the war of life is connected to the nervous system of the world, the ganglia of our shared horrors. Either a mind so large or so people tell me, and here it seems to be the membrane between the skin of my bones and the skin of this home. The absorbing shock of space that gives when the memories burn their way in or out of me, I would lie here wondering how to tell her I am wrestling with the angel, wrestling with memories in the crevices and cracks of my body, of how I feel right now, what it felt like then in those times, and I am glad she is not here, 
and I wish she were here, and she has no name, because this is some woman I do not know. I practice in the silence of my thoughts the different pitch and rhythm of how I might ask, will you sleep with me? Afraid of what to say, should she say yes, and this decade of my monkish life should lie open and I have to say why I am sitting on the edge of the bed, why I have woke her from the sweet smile I assume she has when I assume her horror is smaller than mine. So I, um, I have a granddaughter who will be five in June. She is ultimate princess. <laughs> My, my middle sister makes sure she maintains that title. <laughs> and when she goes to my sister's house, she, my brother-in-law has built a, a castle for her princess castle <laughs> in her princess room. And um, i like to read a poem for her. Uh, she, is, um, she does ballet. She performs ballet in the house. and. Uh, and um, she's just so, so smart and so beautiful. And she has siblings who are my adopted grandchildren, so I have a house full when I'm there in Baltimore. Remember, for my granddaughter, if I forget to plug the sun, let me know. If I forget to tame the shark's teeth, let me know. If I forget to stop the tsunamis, let me know. If I forget to tie up the bears, let me know. If I forget to chase away the viruses, let me know. If I forget to clean the unclean foods, let me know. If I forget to stop rushing cars, let me know. If I forget to tame the lightning, let me know. If I forget to melt the slippery ice, let me know. If I forget to outlaw nightmares, let me know. If I forget to put perverts away, let me know. If I forget that the divine thing moved inside me to write this, the thing that can do all things, let me know, let me down easy into the earth. So we've just come out of a rather difficult week that began with tax day on April 15th in the marathon. and. Um, Wholeness is something I think um, is a, a goal, and I know it's a goal for me, to be whole and to feel whole. And feeling whole is a challenge when you've been broken. And um, lots of people have been broken this week, and um, they've been broken by people we assume were themselves broken, but in other ways. And I was at Oxford and um, a couple of years ago for a conference, and um, I went to Christ Church with a friend because he's Episcopal and he wanted to be there for Vespers. He'd never done that. And Christ Church in Oxford is where Charles II hid out during the Civil War. He hid there. Even song at Christ Church for wholeness. In the ceiling is the miracle, the stone locking to stone, holding up the place. And when the priest strides over in his garments, I want to join the sanctuary, be settled in the Book of Common Prayer, tied into the histories of wills to power, inside the single strand of my soul, be a foreigner visiting the inexact art of wanting to breathe, wanting to test the lies between earth and nothing, not the unlettered blood or its least atom of difference, move my knees too stiff to kneel, prayers and tears edging out of forgotten closets. <clears throat> Holding the seam of my split self out into the aisle, I make a wish so no one can see in their chanting. As I pray over the Messiah's naked body, our unlikely communion, to summon the least bloodied atom of what can be whole again. In Oxford, the evenings are ordered to our unordered eyes, the left, right, backward origin of English choirs of stairs when we pause at corners the whole place my extended self turned inside out as a child spun into the cruel search for a truth of what i was intended to be my own flesh 
to my own bones. And so it is true that my uncle taught me most of what I know about horses, and he spent, or he has spent his life raising Arabians. And the Arabian horses is a beautiful animal, and it is, it is the foundation breed for all the light breeds. Every light breed of horse can be traced back to the um, Arabian. And um, it has a dish-shaped head and a bulge between the eyes. Its brain is slightly larger than other horses, and nostril flares out, all of these things. I can tell you quite a bit about the conformation. And I'd like to close with a poem that's about taking moonlight rides with my uncle when I was a teenager. He had a horse farm just outside Baltimore, and you probably know Maryland is a, or is a horse state. There are lots of horse farms in Maryland. And we would go in the full moon riding horses, and uh, I'll never forget that. And it's not like the movies. Horses just will not walk into water. They'll stop and look at it. <laughs> I'm not going in there. <laughs> Against forgiveness. In the moonlight, the leaves telegraph the night song the way they brush against us as we go under the wooden bridge across from the Jesuit seminary, stepping in streams, the horses' tunnels of living flesh that we trust. My faith in him is absolute. We go into the woods where mad things can turn the horses into monsters that maim and crush, but he holds life up with hands named by what nature tells the living. I know it from the shadows of whispers in my mind, from the earliest games in a space a big brother should have had, but was taken by him, my uncle like a chocolate bear in the dark, bear that I keep close to me, carving a dark father from questions I do not know, questions I have not the courage to ask, as one asks a question to step from shadow and become the light that leads, shines on the words carved in stone by water. Thank you. Joy, stand up, be strong. Be 
long to yourself Believe in the wealth and joy Grief's Estate The end comes to all things, even to the trying season, even to the heartbreak of April in New England. From the unbidden storm, a stark accounting of scores emerges. One black-capped chickadee Two rumpled robins in dishabille. Three ice-encased apple trees. Thus is the estate of grief. And in the grieving, we claim anew our legacy and inventory comforts amid tragedy. Peach and pear.